Okay, guys, so um, I can tell it's Friday, always. Uh, I think today is really the last time that I'm going to record something on video. I still want to meet you on Monday. I don't know exactly what I will do. Best case scenario, we'll work on SDK for those who haven't finished that. Um, look at the exam three from last year so that you kind of get ready for the last one. Um, answer questions if you have any concerns. We'll see um, what I want to do. Uh, I want to finish interplanetary trajectories today just giving you um, some highlights and solutions for delta v's in particular which I don't, I'm not going to demonstrate because it's all based on Keplerian orbits. There is nothing new to derive the delta v's or the relationships that I'm going to, uh, uh, to show you. So it's all Keplerian here, all the bodies are assumed to be perfectly circular, uh, perfectly spherical and uniform mass distribution, we just used what we learned in Keplerian uh, astrodynamics to transfer from one sphere influence to the other, that's all. Uh, and as I said, this is preliminary uh, interplanetary trajectories. I wasn't uh, planning to go into too much details, too many details. Um, so what we have seen at this point is the timing and the sphere of influence for the patched conics method where we say that uh, uh, for circular to circular, we simplify our lives here. We say that, for example, we go from an inner orbit of the Earth, maybe, to an outer circular orbit of Mars. All the examples are based on those two. And so we said, if this is the Sun, uh, and this is the position of planet 1 on its orbit, let's say before uh, the helio... Um, centric maneuver, the Hohmann transfer, and planet 2 is of course a little bit ahead because it's moving slower and they need to meet at the other side, um, so this is before the maneuver. So if I start from there then somehow I leave the sphere of influence of planet 1 with my spacecraft, I go on half an ellipse which is a Hohmann one, and eventually at the apogee of that ellipse, which is only influenced by the Sun, I meet, I rendezvous with planet 2, so this is planet 2 at the end of the maneuver, so the uh, double prime means at the end of the maneuver, and planet 1 is somewhere here ahead of planet 2, because it's moving faster on its orbit. And so uh, what is happening inside these spheres of influence is what we haven't discussed yet, right? Um, and uh, we have computed the sphere of influence in general for, for a generic planet. What uh, from the Sun's perspective is happening here is that I need, so if, if I call this the departure, uh, and this is the arrival, here from the Sun's perspective I need a velocity VD uh, which is bigger or smaller than the velocity of the planet on its orbit. What do you think? It's bigger, right? Energy considerations, this is a bigger same major axis, it's a Hohmann transfer, you're going from a circle to another circle, here you need to get more than V1. Uh, and you know, I'm not going to sketch this because your book has very nice images that explain this. Uh, but you know, this is what I need here. What I need on the other side is, is the opposite. When I get here, and this is the velocity from the sun's per so let's call this VD um, H, meaning heliocentric, based on the sun. And this will be the velocity of arrival. This is what I see with respect to the sun. Now, is this velocity here, it's parallel, of course, to the velocity of planet one, uh, planet two, when, when the rendezvous, but is it going to be bigger or smaller than the velocity of planet two on its, on its orbit? This case is going to be smaller, right? Because that's what you do with the Hohmann transfer. Again, for now, I'm just looking at things from the sun's perspective. Somehow, I have to speed up here, and so V1, the velocity of planet 1, was not enough. And, and, and here, uh, I also have to uh, speed up. Okay, so let's zoom in now, because that is you know, something that we have done uh, several times. And, and, uh, and switch to inside the sphere of influence of planet 1, which is the one I'm leaving. And all this discussion is based on going from inner to outer planet. That's why this sketch looks at the sun to the left, so I'm leaving pretty much in this configuration here where the sun is to my left of the planet and I am inside the sphere of influence. 
So uh, what I need to obtain is a velocity higher than V1. That V1 up, up there is the velocity of your planet around the sun. I need V1 plus the V infinity, right? Make sense? One small consideration here. Um, what if I don't go on a hyperbolic path? So of course here I'm, I'm assuming that I'm orbiting um, around the planet, maybe in a circular orbit, and at some point I maneuver and I go on the hyperbola that will lead me outside of the sphere of influence and then fly around the sun. But what if instead of going on a hyperbolic path, I go on a parabolic path? What happens in that case? What is the velocity at infinity for a parabola? It's zero, right? The velocity relative to the planet. So you could do that. Um, you will reach the sphere influence edge or infinity from the point of view of the planet with zero V infinity, zero excess velocity. That's the definition of parabola, which means that you're not moving anymore. It's kind of a weird assumption here, but you're not moving anymore with respect to the planet, which means that you're flying exactly like the planet around the sun. These are all approximations of the patched conics method where you just look at one planet at a time and the sun and they're completely separate. Of course, these are approximations, but um, if you go on a parabolic path, you will most likely, you know, uh, start flying around the sun like the planet and you never actually leave its sphere of influence, at least in this approximation that we're using. All right, so the delta V is, is what? And I'm not really maneuvering from the sun's perspective. At some point, we'll, we'll dig into maneuvering in this point right here, right? But from the sun's point of view, this is my delta V, right? This is what I need in addition to V1 to go to the right velocity uh, around the sun. So the uh, delta V, if you want to call it that way, in D, which is V infinity, is also equal to, and this is all known information uh, that you can compute with the, this V equation, the energy equation, basically doing a Hohmann transfer. There's nothing new here. I'll just give you the final result. Mu of the sun now over R1 that multiplies the square root of 2 R2 over R1 plus R2 minus 1, where R1 is obviously the radius of the orbit of planet 1 around the sun, and R2 is the radius of orbit 2 around the sun. And so you can see here that uh, this piece times 1 is nothing else than V1, right? You see that? This is the circular velocity of the planet 1 around the sun. And so this other term here is, um, is the velocity that you would need around the sun, is this VDH, is what you need to actually go on this half ellipse. Is this making sense? So this is just to compute the V infinity that you need to have to leave the sphere of influence of planet 1 and go exactly on a Hohmann transfer. But this is the V infinity, it's not the actual delta V that you're going to create with an engine, all right? Because I'm doing this computation from the sun's perspective where I am so far away from everything that I don't even see inside the sphere of influence. But in reality, what I'm doing, I'm creating this V infinity inside the sphere of influence. I need to create that somehow. So I need to put my satellite in that condition to have enough excess velocity to leave and live on the correct trajectory around the sun. And that's the V infinity you need. So basically, V infinity is given to you, right, from this simple solution here. So given a few things, uh, looking at that sketch, I'm going to say um, that I am given V infinity. Just, just its norm is enough, you know, these this velocities are parallel, the infinity and V1 are, need to be parallel for this particular transfer, which is a Hohmann one. And what else? If I need to figure out how to get there at the edge of the sphere of influence from my initial parking orbit, let's say that I am on a circular one, so let's say that I'm given RP, the radius of the circular parking orbit, and this can be generalized, maybe you are on an elliptical orbit, it doesn't matter. Uh, but the bottom line is that Probably your spacecraft has been injected into an orbit around planet one, the Earth, and at some point you decide you're ready to maneuver. At that point P, um, that needs to be in the right position, will get there, so that you get that V infinity up there. All right, so if you're given these two, 
you can compute a few different things, and I'll, again, I'll give you the results because it's all Keplerian, um, perfectly Keplerian astrodynamics. There's nothing fancy behind these expressions. You can look in the book how they derive them. It's just a few steps. Uh, I really don't want to spend the time on them. You just want to understand what, what, uh, what are the steps to get to the right maneuver. Because the maneuver is going to occur at P, not here from the sun's perspective. When I get here, the maneuver is done already. I already have the V infinity. Uh, okay, so, so you, can get, uh, you can get the following. You can compute the eccentricity or the hyperbolic path through this expression, Rp v infinity squared over mu of planet 1. This is separate. If someone tells you, you need to go on a Hohmann transfer around the sun from planet 1 to planet 2, first thing you do is you go here and compute your v infinity. First thing, that's how much excess velocity you need to go on the right transfer. H, standing for Hohmann transfer, okay? So this is given to you. This is where your satellite was, spacecraft, whatever, was parked before you decide that it's time to leave the planet. So this is a given quantity. Uh, yeah. That's with respect to the sun still, right? Now, this is all in the sphere of influence now. Okay. Right. So the moment I transitioned here was when I derived the V infinity. Once I know that this is how much excess velocity I need, I create that inside the sphere of influence. Make sense? Again, these are separate steps. They are completely independent. You compute the V infinity, and then you decide what to do with that. And again, this depends on what was your parking orbit. Maybe you were not on a circular orbit. Maybe you were on a highly elliptical orbit, then some of these formulas will change, but that's the example we're looking at, which is the most common. So the first thing you do, you compute the eccentricity of that um, um, hyperbolic path, having these two. This is what it is. You can easily verify that. What is the next thing you want to know? At the end, I want to compute how much fuel I really need to burn at that point P, right? I want to know where on that circle I am supposed to trust to perform my impulsive maneuver and how much I need to do it so that eventually I go on that asymptote that is parallel to V1 and my velocity is V infinity. So that's what I'm trying to solve for. So what else uh, do you need? The velocity at perigee on that hyperbolic path, I don't know, yeah, I can fit in here. So VP, uh, let's call this high hyperbola, okay? This is going to be, do we need this? I don't think we need this anymore, right? This is the square root of V infinity squared plus 2 mu of planet 1 over Rp. So that's, that's your next uh, result. And you're basically almost done because now you know the velocity you need to have at the perigee of the hyperbolic path. You know that you are in a circular one. So the actual delta V, now this is the real delta V that you're going to create, is the velocity at perigee on the hyperbolic path minus whatever was your velocity on the circular path. I should plug this in, otherwise we'll keep doing this. Yes. Uh, and that's, you know, it's this quantity minus the circular velocity. So it's square root of the infinity squared plus 2 mu 1 over Rp minus uh, circular velocity is uh, mu 1, square root of mu 1 over Rp. So this is your actual delta V now. This is what you really create with your engines. If you were parked on a circular orbit and you need to go on a hyperbolic one such that your excess velocity is this one so that you go on a Hohmann transfer to planet 2. Sequence makes sense? So you look at things from the sun's perspective, Forgetting about the sizes of the planets and the sizes of the spheres of influence, you compute what are the velocities you need to have at the two sides of the half ellipse. Uh, from the first one, you get the V infinity, and from that uh, and the parking orbit, you back out eccentricity, the velocity at perigee of the hyperbola, and eventually your delta V. You can look at, I invite you to look at the steps to get these solutions. I will never ask you to do this in an exam, okay, just to be clear. This is all. 
uh, procedures and formulas we have seen to get here. There's nothing, nothing uh, special. It's all based on energy and the definition of eccentricity. Uh, the thing to pay attention to are some of the numerical examples in the book where you see that if you have engines with ISP of a few hundred seconds that are, you know, realistic technology, you're looking at delta V's uh, fuel consumptions that take more than half of your spacecraft mass. It's expensive. If it was expensive to change inclination on the same orbit, imagine how expensive it is to actually leave the sphere of influence and go to Mars. So uh, that's how it is. Now, the, there's one more piece that I am missing here. What am I missing? So, what is it? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. then we'll do the arrival, yes. We have to do the opposite. Uh, but there is one thing. This is going to guarantee, if I am part on this circular orbit with this radius, and I give this delta V to my spacecraft, I know for a fact that I'm going on a hyperbolic path that will have that excess velocity. But that excess velocity is a vector. It needs to be pointing parallel to V1, right? So I can't just do it at any point on this circle. Because if you move it here, then the V infinity will point somewhere there. It's not going to add up with, to V1 the way I want it. So the last thing you want to compute is that beta angle, which we have probably seen uh, when we talked about, uh, we have definitely seen when we talked about hyperbolic orbits. And that is a function of the eccentricity. It's quite simple. Beta is the arc cosine of 1 over E. And he is, the, of course, the hyperbolic E, Okay, the one that you computed before. Um, so with that, you know exactly when you're going to do it on the circle. You can't just do it anywhere. Make sense? Because that is the angle between basically the V1 direction, which is where you want your asymptote to be, and, uh, and the line of ups is basically where you actually can burn to have the correct magnitude and the correct pointing of V infinity. Is this clear? All I'm trying to do for interplanetary trajectories is look at vectors here and combine them together. That's all we really need to do. And a few equations that tell you how much this is going to cost you. Okay? Questions on this? Should be uh, pretty straightforward. So now, when you get there, actually, there's a couple of other images. Let me see. Uh, no, not on this. So this, this write down the, na the numbers of these figures because they're pretty... They're pretty good. I like them. So the next one is A13, which looks at the arrival. Now, this is still based on going on a bigger circle, okay? Without loss of generality, that's, that's what we're doing. So now, if I am coming in from the sun's perspective, we said slower, right? Didn't we say that? If you, when you arrive on the apogee of the transfer ellipse, you are slower than planet two, correct? You left the circle, you went to the circle. Just forget about the fact that we're talking about sun and planets. On a Hohmann transfer, you need to speed up here to go on this ellipse. And once you get here, if you want to transfer to the bigger circle, you have to speed up again. So going to the bigger circle means matching the velocity of planet two from the sun's perspective. So you come here with uh, a heliocentric velocity, the velocity with respect to the sun that is not enough. If you don't do anything, you're not going into the circle. We just keep going here on this ellipse. So you need to speed up here. Which means that from uh, the planet two perspective, we say this, that we are coming from the front of the sphere of influence. In other words, the V infinity that before was adding up uh, on top of V1, this is, is now subtracting, right? Make sense? So whatever you need to do there will be uh, some delta V that happens at, uh, again, probably a perigee of some desired circular orbit if you want to remain there, um, and, and other things that you may want to do so that uh, you get the obtained motion with respect to the target planet. So the things that you may want to play with here, this V infinity is given to you. And, and what is that? If, um, let's say, uh, I have V, we call this the point of arrival. V arrival with respect to the sun, uh, and then I have V, this is my V of planet two, right? V arrival, 
and v, just call it v2. So what is v infinity here? So that's again given. It's just that now I'm arriving at the other planet. Before I was leaving the planet, but it was still given. You're just doing a Hohmann transfer here. So uh, this has to be. What do you think? Is this correct? Am I contradicting myself? Which one is the big one? I said the B arrival was not enough. Right? Didn't I say that? The circular orbit of planet 2 um, around the sun is faster than uh, whatever is the velocity at this apogee. So it's actually V2, no? Minus VAH. Anyways, it's a difference between the two. So that's given, okay? So you, you decided to go on a Hohmann transfer to get to planet 2. Well, then this is again given. This is the velocity of planet 2 on a circular orbit, some, some uh, square root of mu sun over R2, nothing more than that. And this is whatever is the velocity at the apogee of this Hohmann transfer that you can figure out pretty easily. So that's a given. Now, what can I play with at this point? I'm coming in from the front with a V infinity that is right there, and, uh, and it's pointing exactly opposite to V2. Okay, that's fine. What else can I play with? See this? This is the uh, distance between the asymptote of entry in the sphere of influence and the direction of flight of the planet around the sun. So that delta value there um, can change a few things. You can play with it in such a way that maybe your perigee of the hyperbola, if you don't do anything, actually is exactly the radius of the planet. So you're going to crash to the planet. You can do that. You know, it's preliminary, the sign of orbits here. I can, you know, size that distance, try to get to the right distance so that my uh, closest point to the planet is very close, maybe because I want to land there. Uh, that's one thing you could do. Or maybe you want to go into an elliptical or circular orbit, so you choose what this RP is, uh, and it's not the radius of the planet. And there is another thing that you could do, the third option, which is right there. The dotted line, oh, I'm sorry, the uh, dashed line. Nothing. Well, you still size delta, and I'll give you how you do it. You still size delta so that you pass at a certain distance at perigee of the hyperbola from the center of the planet. But if you don't burn anything there, you don't turn on an engine, you don't absolutely care about the satellite's trajectory, it will just continue on its hyperbolic path and it will exit somewhere here. Then that's called the flyby. I'm going to open a parenthesis before, before I give you any, uh, any um, expression here. So, uh, from the sun's perspective, for the flyby, I just want to talk about this real quick because it's, it's extremely powerful. So, in that scenario right there, um, at entry, what do we have? Uh, we have the velocity of planet 2, V2, right? We have V infinity, right? And so this is, this little velocity here is, uh, what do I call it here? Is, is the velocity of your spacecraft uh, with respect to the sun, right? Make sense? This is at, at the entry point, it's down here. The, the uh, planet is flying with velocity v2 with respect to the sun, right here, this vector. The uh, spacecraft is moving with respect to the planet with a velocity v infinity. So the addition of these two vectors is going to give me the spacecraft velocity with respect to the sun. Right? It's all relative motion, right? So I have that tiny vector right there, whatever this is, whatever the value of, of it is, but it's you know, parallel to v2. Now at the exit, see what happens. I have still V2, right? Uh, yeah, V2 is down here. 
Now, I haven't done anything. I let the spacecraft fly on its hyperbolic path with some perigee that I selected. I'll tell you how. Uh, that is not really the point here. Uh, there are all formulas you can play with. But the point is, I haven't crashed into the planet. I flew around it, didn't do anything to the velocity. What is the magnitude for now of the velocity when you exit with respect to the planet on the dashed line? It's another beam infinity. You haven't done anything, right? You came from infinity with infinity, you're just living on the other side with infinity. Except, there's been a turn there. And that is the angle delta. So, from the sun's perspective, what you're doing now is you're adding, I'm trying to make it at the same angle, more or less. If I added them here, I'm going to add them here as well to find the velocity of my spacecraft with respect to the sun. Look what I get. This is my new velocity spacecraft heliocentric, right, with respect to the sun. So before I even look at any formulas, I'm very excited about flybys. What I am doing here is absolutely nothing. The planet is working for me, and it's creating a huge delta V, probably. This is comparable, you know, there is a delta angle that is probably a measurable angle. Uh, it's comparable to changing inclination. Here you're taking, not only you're changing the magnitude of the vector, you're changing its direction. That's very expensive. And you are doing that without any fuel. Flybys are great. I have, there is an image in the book that talks about, that shows you the Cassini mission and how many flybys the planned. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. It's all free, uh, fuel free. It took years, but it works. So uh, these are the different things you can do. Um, let me give you a few expressions that may be useful. So here I'm still given, yeah. Um, yeah, this is all gone. The eccentricity you computed exactly as before, it's exactly the same formula, nothing else. So given these two, you, you're going to go and compute E as before, 1 plus RP V infinity squared over, now this is mu2. So this again, this is whatever it is, as you come in, uh, this is what you've chosen. It could be the radius of the planet if you want to crash into it or not. And, um, and from that, one thing that you can compute that is of interest is the delta angle. How much you can turn if you don't do anything. Uh, delta is 2 arc sine, and we have seen this as well, of 1 over E. So you can uh, choose the right RP to give you the delta that you want, for example. And, uh, and finally, um, there is also the expression for big delta, the uh, distance that we've been talking about there. It's RP square root of 1 plus 2 mu 2 RP V infinity squared. So with this expression, you can choose what to do. This is given to you. This is something you choose. You go to the eccentricity. Uh, and you find out how much you're turning the velocity if you're doing a flyby, and what is the distance you actually need to come in to obtain all this. Because again, you can just, you, you choose these, then you have to make it happen. And the way you make it happen is by approaching the planet uh, at a certain distance. There is another nice image that I want to show you that shows the uh, effect. So it's 816, shows you the effect of changing that delta distance or aiming radius, whatever you want to call it, not this one, this one down here, right? This is just turning things 90 degrees. You're coming in with your V infinity, you just choose different distances with respect to the direction of flight, the, you know, yeah, the direction of flight of, uh, of, the, of the planet. And of course, as you get closer and closer, your perigee goes down and eventually you may be tangent to the planet. Um, but that's, you know, that's your design uh, procedure. You are given this, you play with this until you get something that you like. Uh, maybe the delta angle that you like. Or if that is not what you're doing, you're not doing a flyby, you really want RP to be, I don't know, 7,000 kilometers and then you're going to circularize there, then you just you know, go through these steps to get you the right big delta. Yes? So 
it's, it's actually the opposite. The further you get, you go at the limit. Um, if this is the sphere of influence of your planet, planet is here, and I'm trying to sketch it in that uh, with that orientation. So this is your V. Why do they have the infinity there? I don't know. Uh, anyways, if this is a sphere of influence, and this is your V2, as we called it, and you are coming in, we said you're coming in from the front in a certain way. So as you come in with same same V infinity, right? Uh, you come here at a certain distance, you're going to suffer the effect of the attraction of the planet, but as you go f farther away, you see that less and less, until I guess the limit is that you are at the edge and you come in with the infinity and it re remains parallel to itself, so you don't do anything to the infinity. Make sense? So, so that vector addition that you do is you pretty much draw vectors between the edges of the sphere. Right, right, right. So the infinity remains in magnitude the same, it's just what you're doing to it. It's the infinity here at the entry as a vector, and it's the infinity, oh man, they start with the same. Entry, exit, okay? So magnitude-wise, it's going to be the same, but the closer you are to the planet, the more you're going to turn it. So, so the max speed that you get is one that pretty much goes right through the diameter. I mean, you get the planet. But yeah, yeah. Uh, I believe so. Yeah, because you know, the I'm just thinking the extreme cases is you are basically outside the sphere of influence. You're not going to do anything to the infinity in principle, so you're not changing anything for the spacecraft. While the the other extreme is your tangent to the to the yeah to the planet, and you turn this, you take this v infinity, you you make it change direction as much as you can. So that's the biggest angle that you can create because of gravitational attraction. Yeah, make sense? Yeah. If you don't do anything, no, you don't change the magnitude. Yeah, at, at least in this perfect, you know. Patched conics, Keplerian approach. Then, of course, that planet may have an atmosphere, so you do a flyby that is maybe assisted by some drag, so you're going to change the velocity as well, uh, in terms of the speed, the magnitude of the velocity vector. So, yeah, that, that can be done as well. Um, of course, then in that case, you will need fancy, fancier you know, models of the planets and the atmosphere and numerical simulations to do more accurate planning, but yeah. If, if there's no atmosphere, the only thing you're doing is using gravity. With these simplifications that we have assumed, uh, you are taking the infinity and you change its direction. That's all you do. Isn't this great? I think it's great. So, um, yeah. Let me show you that image. What is it? I wrote it down. No. Yes. 824. You may have seen this. It's nothing that new at all. Cassini seven year mission to Saturn left. So this is a bunch of flybys. Uh, left the Earth in 1997. Um, so this is the first trajectory, the red one. It met Venus. So this was the first flyby after a year, a little less than a year, that made it move to a different, bigger trajectory. So these old flybys are making, in this, in this uh, mission, they're making the orbit bigger and bigger. That's what they're doing, without thrusters. Almost without thrusters, of course. So let's see, first flyby here, you go to the green trajectory. Uh, there is another flyby with the same planet after more than a year this time uh, with Venus that led the spacecraft on this blue trajectory. This is all trajectories with respect to the sun. Um, after which there is an encounter with the Earth again, actually. So the third flyby is with the Earth uh, the same year. And that gives it a kick to go on the purple one until Jupiter is met in 2000, year 2000, and then there is a flight for four years to Saturn. So this took seven years, and people running pretty complicated models, of course, to time all these maneuvers. And of course, it's not perfectly, you know, propellantless. 
the, the, there have been adjustments to get to the right delta distances and, 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 and do these flybys the right way, but it is definitely cheaper than thinking about all those as being actual delta Vs from engines because they will be so expensive that probably at the first or second you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have any, anything left. Yes? Sure. Yeah. You can. If I'm not mistaken here. Um, no, this doesn't, right? There's none of these that seems to decrease the orbit. Uh, I'm not sure if this blue one, it only shows a portion. I don't, I don't think it's smaller. In terms of same major axis, I don't think it's smaller than, yeah. Um, plane-wise, uh, there's another image in the book, the one that I skipped before. Uh, plane-wise, it doesn't really matter how you do this. You can rotate this in 3D um, and, and not, nothing really changes. So, um, unless, yes, unless your arrival as Saturn has to be in a specific plane around the planet, uh, all these flybys can be at any what is that picture? And so my question would be how much delta V in total would this flight, did this flight take? I, like I do not. Uh, the entire, this entire like mission? After, like after it's, you know, after the left or sphere of influence. Right. How much delta V would that take? Like once it was out of, outside. Like well, how much did it have to adjust? To adjust to, so the adjustments that I was talking about, um, they would be for things such obtaining the right big delta at the entry of the next planet, right? Because you know that you need to obtain a rotation uh, of a certain little delta here. Um, so first flyby you have to do, you know the V infinity you're coming in. Um, you need to choose the right RP that gives you this and in turn will give you this delta. So unless you are so precise in putting your a heliocentric trajectory, designing that so that you actually reach that delta when you get to the next planet. I'm assuming that some adjustments are needed for something like this. So um, is this just a product of our models not being good enough? Yeah. Because I assume we can pre-calculate all of those. Right? All these, these, these uh, assuming that you don't have to do any adjustments, all these can be pre-calculated probably without, you know, ke with Keplerian models they can be done pretty easily. Uh, probably, but um, I'm pretty sure that the uh, models that they used for these are not simply Keplerian. So maybe even on a piece of paper they did some preliminary calculations, but then this went through more accurate models. If nothing else, models that have the actual relative position of the planets at a certain time, and things like the SPICE toolkit that, that Patrick showed you. I was, let me just give me a second, I was going to get that image. Did you see that? This one. So, you can actually come in at different planes. Uh, you're still going to obtain the same delta V. Uh, but yeah, you're right. Uh, if, if your goal eventually is to get into orbit around the planet on an equatorial orbit, then uh, you need to be careful you will have to correct for that. So maybe you left Earth at a certain inclination, and uh, that inclination, unless you do anything, will continue to remain the same through these flybys, unless there's something that moves your heliocentric orbit away from its original plane. Uh, does it make sense? Any other questions? So I think with these, I can actually almost close this up, but uh, since we have a little more time, let's look at, let's start looking at, since we're talking about interplanetary trajectories, um, last year's test, I sent you the solutions, right? Did I send you the solutions for last year's test, exam three? There was something about interplanetary trajectories, just to give you an idea of the level of difficulty of question. 
Say it again. Was it? No? Anything? I just, you know, want to show you what kind of questions I am planning to give you on that, if, if any. Uh, nothing really that requires any calculations almost. So cross your shire, cross your shire. I think this was only the last one. So the question was a spacecraft. Ah, I think I just told you this at the beginning of the class. Orbiting Mars needs to return to Earth. Okay. Assuming a heliocentric Coleman transfer, how would you point the V infinity velocity with respect to Mars? Uh, I'm explaining that's the velocity with respect to Mars on the escape hyperbola um, with respect to the heliocentric velocity of Mars. This was really a very simple question. It's to be parallel, right? So, there was really nothing special. Uh, I thought there was something else about, um, you no, know, close to the Shire, relative motion. There was nothing else about interplanetary trajectories, no? No. So something as simple as thinking about the velocity of the planet and the infinity and how they need to combine to obtain a certain goal is something that you could expect. Uh, Calculations-wise, I gave you maybe two or three formulas for the departure and arrival, uh, but I would probably not ask you to compute any of those. Uh, that is not my goal on this topic, at least. So for Monday, uh, we could, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll think about what to do. We could either continue a little bit on this, uh, look at the entire test as, as an exercise. Uh, I'll take more questions if you have any. There is one topic that I usually don't um, uh, address in class, and it's quaternions. Have you ever heard of quaternions? So that is mostly for those of you who will go into aerospace to sign one next semester because we'll definitely use them as part of that. So that's attitude control. So everything that we have done here is point masses, right? We talked about orbit angles a little bit just because they are basically three of the orbital parameters that we have used, but we haven't done any rotational mechanics in this class. Um, but for the spacecraft design class next semester. I don't know what the project will be yet, but if you look at the one from last year, you know, these spacecraft are not just flying around as points. They probably have antennas, sensors, something that is measuring something else, a camera. Um, so attitude control is part of the game, and, uh, and people don't do that with other angles on spacecraft. So I may introduce quaternions a little bit, uh, which is not part of the syllabus. It's not something that I would ask you on the test. But I don't know, I think that at least half of the class is going to be in aerospace design one. A big percentage. So I'll, I'll think about that. Maybe we'll do that. Any other questions on this? No? See you on Monday. <laughs>